When I was in high school, I had to read the book, A Tale of Two Cities. Anybody remember that? Anybody actually remember what it was about? I don't, but I do remember this. It was the best of times. It was the what? Worst of times. Amen. It kind of feels like we're living in that right now, doesn't it? Mostly just the worst of times, I think. No, it's good. God is good. And I share that with you because today we're going to be looking at a tale of two servants. And uh, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 24. We've really been looking at the entire gospel of Matthew over the last year plus. And today we find ourselves continuing to look at the end game, right? When Christ is going to return. And it is an exciting thing, but there are many warnings also involved if you are not prepared. And so while it's a time to be anticipated, a time to be cele- uh, celebrated, a time to be uh, excited, it can also be a time to be fearful if you are caught unprepared. And so Jesus is spending a good portion of chapters 24 and 25, telling his followers what to expect and how to be ready. Uh, Oftentimes, when we think about end times, we only think about that moment, right? That moment in which one is left in the field and one is taken away, which we looked at last week. But the point of living uh, or being ready is that we are living ready, right? We're not just getting ready. We're not just ready at the moment, but we are living every day in preparation for that day because we don't know when that day is going to be this day. Amen? That was a lot of days in there. So this morning we're going to look at a parable that Jesus tells at the end of chapter 24 about what we do while we wait. What kind of lives should we live? What should our daily lives look like? What should we be ready for? And so we're going to look this morning at that. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, who was a theologian back many years ago, uh, wrote uh, several life resolutions that he rehearsed to himself uh, daily and weekly and monthly in order that he would uh, make the most of his time while he was on the earth. And I want to read just five of them to you this morning. I've kind of summarized them so that they flow better in English. But the first one was this, never do anything which I should be afraid to do if this was my last hour on earth. Never do anything uh, that I should be afraid to do, or excuse me, which I should be afraid to do if this were my last hour. If I knew that I was about to die in the next hour, would my life be different? Would I act different? Would I think different? What would I confess to the Lord? What would I share with other people? Am I ready if this were to be my last day? Another one, never do anything which I should be afraid to do if the last trumpet were to sound in the next hour. If you knew Jesus was coming back in the next hour, How would you live differently? Another one that he wrote, to ask God every night before bed if I was negligent in any matter or have committed any sin. So he's getting in bed and he's asking the Lord, have I done anything today that would displease you? Obviously in preparation for confession and repentance. Uh, Another one he asks is to, to ask God at the end of every day, every week, and every month, is there anything I could have done better for the kingdom? Is there anything I could have done better for the kingdom? And then lastly, to act as though, and I love this one, to act as though I had already seen the happiness of heaven and the torment of hell. If you really knew how glorious heaven was going to be, if you had already tasted the the beauty and power and majesty of walking the streets of gold, of being with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you had seen how horrible hell will be, the, the, the torment, the pain, the separation, the destruction. If you had tasted each of those, then how would you live your life differently in order that you would be able to walk in the glories and avoid the torments? It kind of reminds me of uh, our own measures that we have here at our church. You see, we, we want to do the, kind of the same thing, right? We want to develop disciples who are seeking the kingdom, who are walking in the kingdom. And so, Uh, Several years ago, we put together these seven measures, and we attached a question similar to the statements that Jonathan Edwards made. We attached questions. And and the purpose of these questions is that you and I might do the same thing, that as we're living our lives, whether it's every night or every week or every month, we might ask ourselves, how am I growing? How am I progressing in my life uh, as I pursue the kingdom? So uh, in case you're new to us, I just want to read some of those to you. Right, so our first measure of a disciple is that we are Jesus speakers. 
And, and what does that mean? It means that we, we're not afraid to talk about the name of Jesus to people. We're not afraid to mention the fact that He is the Master and Savior of our lives. And so we just attach this question to uh, help us self-evaluate. Who heard me speak His name today? Who heard me speak the name of Jesus? Did I go all day and share his name? Did I even say his name, right? If he's that important to me, surely I would be talking about him at least some throughout the day. The second is word lover, right? What did, the, what did God say to me through the Bible? Well, obviously for God to speak to you through the Bible, you had to open the Bible. You had to spend some time in the Bible. Are you spending time reading and loving and memorizing and meditating on God's Word. And so sometimes I get in bed at, at night and I think to myself, or I ask myself the question, how much time did I really invest in God's Word today? Uh, faith walker is another one. How did I trust God with the unknown? Well, you know, right now in our world, there's a lot of unknowns, isn't there? Uh, there's a lot of things that we're, we wonder, how's that going to work out? What's that going to look like? And right now, it's a great opportunity to just trust in the sovereignty of God and say, God, I believe. I trust in you. You are good. Your love endures forever. Your mercies are new every morning. I will walk by faith and not by sight. I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't like it. Whatever it may be, we're trusting in God and walking by faith. Another one is to be a real lifer. And for us, that just means uh, we have relationships where we can be authentic and transparent. So we ask the question, who knows my stuff and loves me anyway? Who knows the real me? Not the, the me that comes to church and puts on the nice clothes and does all the right things and is kind to everybody and welcoming. But who knows the things I'm really burdened about? Who knows the things I'm struggling about? Who knows my failures where I can confess and say, hey, I'm really hurting over here. I'm really struggling with this. We need those relationships with other believers and inside our family and with inside the body of the church that help us to be authentic and real with the Lord. And the other one is generous giver. Who, uh, what resources am I investing in eternity? Am I using my time, my talent, my treasure, all that God has entrusted me with as a steward in His kingdom? Am I, am I investing that in the right places? Another one for us is foot washer. Right? To be a servant. Who, who am I serving in humility? And that doesn't necessarily or always mean, well, I'm teaching Sunday school on Sunday morning. That's fantastic. We want you to teach. I'm, I'm, I'm greeting people in the lot. Great. I'm serving in the video ministry. Great. But it's even more so just day to day. D did I say kind things and lift up and serve my family? Did I uh, help that person who was stranded on the side of the road? Did I meet that need that I saw in somebody's life when I had an opportunity to serve them in my office place or at my school? So it can be very small things, but we want to have a servant's heart. And then lastly, uh, am I a knee bender? Have I demonstrated my dependence upon God in prayer? Am I, am I trusting in Him by lifting my needs up to Him that He is the way, and He is the truth, and He is the life, and, and, and we can do nothing apart from Him and His power. Are we truly committed ourselves to prayer? I mentioned all of these, and I mentioned this self-exercise, because I believe that if Jesus' return is imminent, and it is, then it ought to impact how we live each hour, week, and day of our lives. So today we're going to look at this parable uh, up from Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51, and we're going to see that while we are living expectantly, which we talked about last week, we ought to also live purposefully. So we want to live expectantly, waiting for His appearance, waiting for His return, but while we are expecting, we want to live with purpose. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, and I'd invite you to stand with me this morning. As we honor the reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to begin in verse 45. And God says this through the writer Matthew, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. And in that place there will be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. Father, we are grateful for your word. There's many things to rejoice about in this text, and there's many things that ought to catch our attention as warnings. Father, I pray this morning that you would show us and reveal to us our true character, whether or not we are found as a wise and faithful servant, or Father, or whether we are wicked in self, uh, dealing in self-pleasure and self-glorification. Um, Father, we want to be and we desire to be servants, stewards in your household, stewards in your kingdom that glorify the name of Jesus faithfully and wi- with wisdom. Father, I pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable unto you, for you are my rock and my redeemer. And I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to share with you ten things that I think we see in this text this morning, and they will be pretty transparent, right? There's not a whole lot of new things that we need to draw out of this text, but instead this is a great parable that we need to practice on being doers of the word and not hearers only. The first thing, and it's the most obvious, is be a faithful servant. Be a faithful servant. Verse 45, who then is the faithful and wise servant? That word faithful there means trusted, dependable, reliable. And so when we talk about what it means to be faithful, it means to fulfill all of the things that God has asked of us to be dependable. I have kids at my house and sometimes we, uh, my wife and I might leave and go to the grocery store or have to do something. We'll leave a list of things, right? These are the list of things I need you to do before mom and dad get home, right? We need you to be faithful to these things because we're leaving you in charge, right? We're leaving you as responsible over the house while we're gone. And while we're gone, you need to be faithful to accomplish these things. Now, and they're, they're not always responsive to those things, if we're honest, right? But in hindsight or in foresight, we're not always faithful either. I know I'm not. God has given us a, 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 a set of things in the Scripture about how we're to live, how we're to think, how we're to walk, how we're to talk, how we're in our people. I'm not always good at those things, right? I don't always faithfully execute those things. But the calling to us is to be faithful, right? He is the master of the house, and he has placed in his, uh, uh, under his care us as stewards, uh, as responsible managers in the kingdom. And he's saying, hey, while I am gone, right? While I am away, you are to be doing something. And the primary thing that you and I are to be doing is the Great Commission, Right? Going into all the world and making disciples. Teaching them to obey all that he's commanded. That's the primary mission of our lives. It's the mission of our church. It's the mission of the people of the kingdom. is to fulfill the great commission. And then how are we to do that? Well, it, back to what Pastor Patrick mentioned earlier in Deuteronomy. And Jesus sums up as the greatest commandment. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and the strength. And to what? Love our neighbor as ourselves. If, if our lives could be drilled into those things of loving God, loving our neighbor, and carrying out the Great Commission, we will be found faithful because we will be doing in our lives what we are called to be doing while we are awaiting the return of the King. The second thing we ought to see in this text is that we are to be wise. We are to be stewards or servants that are walking in wisdom. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? When I place somebody in charge of something, when I give somebody a responsibility, not only do I want them to be faithful in doing it, I want them to be wise in the way they execute that, that uh, responsibility, right? Because there are going to be things that come up that I'm not going to have addressed specifically, right? And when I give somebody instruction, whether it's at my house or, or one of our staff, and I say, here's what we need to do, I can't account for every possible scenario that might go on around that task. I need them to practice wisdom in how they execute that because there may be some things that they didn't see. Jesus, if you read through Matthew 24 and 25, he doesn't give you every single thing, right? Even the book of John tells us that Jesus did many more things and taught many more things that are not included, right? Because there's not enough books to include all of his, te- all of his instruction, all of his wisdom, all of his grace, so forth. So he gives us his wisdom. Now, you say, well, what, what wisdom should I operate from, right? Well, not the wisdom of the world, right? The wisdom of the world is what? Foolishness. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
So if we walk in Christ, he will give us wisdom, right? In, in, in James, it tells us that we are to be people who pray and ask for what? Wisdom. That if we do not have it, God will give it to us gen, uh, generously. So we are to be wise stewards. That word wise there means understanding, resulting from insight. How do we get that insight? By spending time in the Word of God, by spending time in prayer, asking that He would show us and, and teach us in all things. So we're to be faithful. We're to be wise. We're to be responsible servants. We're to be responsible. Look at verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household? So we have been set over something. We've been given a what? Responsibility to carry out something. That phrase there, set over, means to assign someone to a position of authority over others or to be placed in charge of something. And what is this responsible steward, this responsible um, uh, servant to do? In this case, he is to take care of the household, right? Right? He says, to give them their food at the proper time. The assumption is that this person is responsible and there are people under his or her care that need his assistance or her assistance. And so I always think about a family in this case, right? That, that I'm to be responsible as a father to my children. I'm to be responsible as a husband to my wife. That means caring for them, meeting their needs, being available, being a servant to them. And in the kingdom, it's the same, right? We are to what? We are to look over the needs of each other as the body of Christ. We are to look over the needs of, of the people of the kingdom. We're to serve them. We're to care for them. We're to give them food at the proper time to meet their needs. So we're to be responsible servants. We're, number four, to be diligent servants. Be diligent servants. Why? Verse 46. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. You notice it doesn't say so talking when he comes. Because we are really good at talking about what we need to do and not, it's quite, not quite as good at doing. Like that old country song says, we need a little less talk and a lot more action, Right? We need a little less talking about it and a lot more doing it. It's why the Scripture says, Be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. And so here we see in this passage that this, when the Master comes back, He will find what? The servant doing His will, not just talking about His will. I, I'm really good at talking about all the things I need to do at my house. I got a long list of things that need to be repaired, that need to be painted, that need to be fixed, that need to be clean, and I can talk a great game. I'm going to get to that, right? I'm going to put that on my list. And when I say to my wife, I'm going to put that on my list, it means it's going to be way down on the list. And I may not even look at the list for a while. But I can talk about what I need to do. Yeah, the reason I haven't done that, babe, is I haven't had a chance to go to Home Depot, pick up these five supplies that I'm going to need. Or I've got these meetings coming. I don't have time. I get, but I can talk about all the reasons why I haven't done it. But I'm not being necessarily diligent to accomplish it. I'm not being a doer of it. We have a lot of people that talk the Christian talk. But we have uh, far fewer that walk the Christian walk. Fifth, we want to be rewarded. We want to be a rewarded servant. You say, well, gosh, that kind of seems like, you know, a little bit self-serving. But the Scripture reminds us repeatedly that when we walk faithful and we walk with wisdom and we walk uh, tr in the truth that there is a reward, right? Because why? Because we're walking in difficulty now. We're walking in suffering now. We're walking in, in pain now. But there is reprieve. There is reward on the horizon if we will be faithful, if we will endure. So look at verse 47. He says, for everybody who's faithful and wise and responsible and diligent, he says, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. So, so there is something at the end. Because guess what? It's hard to be faithful. It's difficult to be wise. It's hard to be responsible. It's challenging to be diligent. But if we walk in those things, there will be a reward. He will set us over all his possessions. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says, If we endure, we will also reign with him. 
So if we are faithful to the very end, we will celebrate the kingdom with him. We will have responsibility in the kingdom to, ex- to receive all of the riches and glory of grace of Christ that come with that. And that's our goal, right? It's to be found faithful, to be rewarded for our labor in the kingdom. And then he turns his attention, he says, but there is another servant, and this servant's not faithful and wise, This servant is wicked. And so the point six is don't be a wicked servant, right? Pretty self-explanatory. Look at verse 48. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed. So we see this idea of being a wicked servant, which means pertaining to evil or having the implication of harmful or damaging action. Then then we know that we're not walking faithfully with God. We're not being faithful. It's the, the contrast to faithfulness is being wicked. And I want you to see one of the primary ways that we can be wicked and what leads us to wickedness sometimes. It's that next phrase, because we say to ourselves, my master is delayed. Because what happens when we start to say, you know what, he's not coming back today. He, He might not come back this week or this month. In fact, I'll just do what I want to do, and then when I get older, or later on in life, I'll get right with God then. I've heard this. You've heard this, right? I'm going to do what I want to do while I'm young. I'm going to have all the fun that I want to have. I want to have all of life's experiences, and when I'm older, then I will do X, Y, or Z. Then I'll have the money to give. Then I'll have the time to serve. Then I'll have the, the, uh, the desire to make things right with God just before I die. My friend, that is a dangerous proposition and an ungodly proposition because we are saying to ourselves, my master is delayed. He's not coming. I'm not going to die. I'm, the kingdom is not on the horizon. And Jesus says that is foolishness and that is of a wicked servant. Well, where does that wickedness come from? Well, in John chapter 8, Jesus tells this, these words to the Pharisees. He says in verse 44, You are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. What are the father's desires? Wicked things. Disobedient things. He says, he was a murderer, Satan, from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And when we start to buy into the lie, he's not coming back now. I can fix it later. I will be ready then. We are, we are walking in the foolishness and in the deceitfulness of the evil one. Because the whole point of Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is Jesus telling his disciples, be ready. I'm coming back. You do not know when it is. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next year. It could be 10 years from now. No one knows the day or the hour. Not the Son, not the angels in heaven, only the Father. And so what is our response to that truth? To be ready every single minute of every single day. To come prepared. To not buy the lie that my master is delayed. The master is not delayed, my friend. The master is right on schedule. The problem is you don't know the schedule. He's ready. He's prepared to come. As soon as the Father says, now is the time, the clouds will part and His foot will step back onto the Mount of Olives and it will be split in two and the glory and the kingdom will be exposed. The question is then, will you be ready? Because the Scripture we saw last week says that two will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be at the grindstone. One will be taken and one will be left. So the Master is not delayed. Don't buy the lies. Don't be a wicked servant. Number seven, do not be a violent servant. Do not be a violent sermon, uh, servant. Look at verse 49. The servant then begins to what? Beat his fellow servants. This is back to loving your neighbor, right? Now, you might be thinking, well, I don't beat people. I'm not a violent person. But maybe you're not a violent person in your physical action, but are you have a, do you have a violent heart? I'm going to get that person. Oh, that person makes me so mad, I'd punch him in the face if I could. 
Or do we use our words violently? I hate you. You're a horrible person. God could never forgive you. Whatever it may be, do we use our words violently as weapons? See, the wicked servant is a violent servant. He doesn't care about the well-being of other people. He takes advantage of them. He strikes them. Proverbs 13.2 says, From the fruit of his mouth a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. It's the same principle that the, the, the heart of the wicked pursues vengeance, per, pursues, r, pursues uh, violence towards others. Don't be a violent servant. Be a loving servant. Be responsible towards others, not violent towards them. Eight, do not be a self-indulgent servant. Look at verse 49. He, a wicked servant eats and drinks with drunkards. And the picture there is not the one that Jesus was accused of, of where Jesus was accused of eating with sinners, because that was a, a, a Jesus reaching out in love and compassion, not participating in their sin, but loving them in their sin. And here this picture of a wicked servant is one participating in sin, right? It's about the pleasures of this world over the pleasures of the kingdom. It's about uh, meeting their own needs instead of meeting the needs of the others, right? The responsible servant feeds those who he's responsible for. Uh, a wicked servant takes for themselves. I will enjoy all of it for me. I will take advantage of all of it for me. I will give myself pleasure, and I don't really care what happens to you. Proverbs 23, 19. Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Be not among the drunkards or among the gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkards and the gluttons will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. Don't be a self-indulgent servant. Number nine, do not be an unprepared servant. We looked at this last week, but look at verse 50. The master of that servant will come on a day when? When he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know. A wicked servant is unprepared for that day. Don't be unprepared. And then lastly, do not be a punished servant. Remember, the contrast was be a rewarded servant. Well, don't be a punished servant. Look at verse 51. And will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a place that I want to be. That does not sound like a, a fun experience to me. I, I think I'd like to avoid that at all costs, right? I, I'd rather walk faithfully and be responsible and be wise and diligent and then receive the, in, in the inheritance of the reward of, of reigning with Him in His glory versus what? Being left behind in the field, being cut into pieces with the hypocrites and where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, here's the reality of this parable, my friends. There are only two types of servants listed. There are not 15 servants. There's not three servants. There are two. You either are taken or left. You either belong to him or you don't. You are either faithful or you are wicked. See, the reality is that only one of these servants actually belonged to God. The other one was no servant at all. He, he was a poser in the kingdom. He, he could have said enough things that maybe some of the people accepted him as a, as a leader, accepted him as a servant. But the reality is when his master returned, his deeds were exposed and he proved himself to be a fraud, a phony. The true servant of the master did something. He lived ready. He purposefully lived so that he would be there when the master returned. He was busy about the master's business and thus he was rewarded. Instead of punished. I think Titus, uh, and Paul in the book of Titus uh, summarizes this parable extremely well. And we finish with this verse. Look at Titus chapter 2 verse 11. What a great summary. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Who is the grace of God? Jesus is the grace of God. He extended his love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he came to what? Bring us salvation. And what else? Verse 12. Training us to what? Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. So, so we are renou renounce violence. We renounce self-indulgence. We, we, we push away from the things of this world, the ungodliness and the worldly passage. And instead, again, 
compare and contrast faithful and wicked servant. Look what Paul does. He says, instead of uh, walking in ungodliness and worldly passions, we as faithful servants live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Right? It's not about what I'm doing 10 years ago. And it's not about what I plan on doing uh, five years from now, right? Well, the Lord is delayed. I'll just do what I want to. No. In the present age, what is your life look like today? How are you living faithfully today in this present age? Waiting for our blessed hope. Who is our blessed hope? Jesus. In the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul is telling Titus the same thing. Be ready. He's going to appear. He's going to come back. And so he says, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who did what? Listen to this carefully, my friends. Who gave himself for us. Jesus gave his life for yours and for mine to redeem us, to buy us back. That's the picture there. Is that he purchased us. His death on the cross bought us. Right? We were lost in our sin. We were on our own. And he t- came down and redeemed us back to his possession. And he says that here in verse 14. Right? Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And then don't miss this last part. Who are zealous for good works. So when he purchases us back and we understand that we belong to him, that he owns our lives, that he is a good master, then what? We will be zealous for serving him. And that is the mark of somebody who's truly saved. The mark of somebody who's truly saved is that they're waiting and anticipating the coming of the Savior. That they are walking in faithfulness and in godliness and in wisdom and in responsibility and in, 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 uh, in, in diligence. And we're zealous for the things of the kingdom. We're not zealous for the things of the flesh. We're not zealous for the pride of life. We're not zealous for be drunkards and gluttons. We're zealous for the good works of the kingdom that God has called us to walk in and to live in. And as we do that, we will demonstrate we are ready for his return. Now, I don't know where you are this morning, and I don't know whether or not you're a faithful servant or a wicked servant, but I know that God knows, and I know that he will reveal it to you if you'll sincerely ask him, God, am I in you? Have I placed my faith and trust in you? Have I received the grace that comes from repenting of my sin and turning my heart and my faith and my life over to him? And so I want us to take just a moment as we close this morning, just to close our eyes and bow our heads, and to have a moment with the Father. And in this quiet moment with the Father, I want you to ask Him, God, am I in you? Do I belong to you? Am I your possession? Have you redeemed my life? And Father, my prayer this morning is in this moment, you would speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would reveal to us whose we are. Father, do we belong to you or do we belong to the things of this world, our own flesh, our own desires? God, bring conviction of our life. And Father, for those who are listening in this moment and hearing your Spirit speak to their hearts and their lives, Father, I pray that if they realize in this moment that they have never put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are not eagerly awaiting His appearing, that they truly don't desire to walk and live and know and serve Him, that, Father, in this moment, that you would call them out of darkness and into your marvelous light, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would bring conviction of their sin causing them a desire to repent and turn their affections from the things of this world to the things of the kingdom and to the king himself. Father, I pray that we would recognize that there's not anything, there's not any sin that we've committed that you cannot extend your grace towards. There's not any period of time that we've walked faithlessly in which you cannot turn into faithfulness. You are good. You are loving. You are compassionate. You are mercy. You, you are merciful. You are, are long-suffering towards us. That while we were yet sinners, you would send your son to die for us, to cover us and to cleanse us and to purchase us back. Father, I believe there may be some here in this room and some watching online who are, who are wrestling this morning with their sin. And they're asking the question, can God really forgive me? 
Father, I pray your spirit this morning would speak to their heart and that they would hear the words, oh yes, I love you. I died for you. Walk with me. Know me. Love me. Serve me. Experience the blessings and the richness that comes from knowing me. Turn away from the wickedness of your heart, the wickedness of your sin. Trust in the fact that I've cleansed it, that I've purified it, and that you are now white as snow. That while your sin was as crimson, it's now been cleansed and you are pure in me. Father, help us to walk in that truth. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that needs that, that in this short moment that they would just call upon your name. For the scripture says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. May they call upon you with faith and repentance today. And then, Father, there are some of us who do know you, but maybe we're not being as faithful. Maybe we're not zealous for good works. Maybe we're, we're toying in the things of the flesh. Father, draw our hearts back to you. Extend your mercy and grace. May we repent today and be faithful and walk faithfully with you, anticipating your return.